So, hello everyone and welcome to the Pregnant Hack podcast. This is episode number four. I have a very special guest for you here today. It's Kelly Harrell. She's based in the United States. And before I treat her properly, let me just read out her bio. So for those of you who are not yet familiar with her amazing work. So um, in her own words, I'm an author, a lifelong deaf walker, an animist, and the founder of Soul Intent Arts on traditional Sissy Pavo land in North Carolina. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, I'm an ordained interfaith minister, and for almost five years, I have taught others to ethically build thriving spiritual paths. My ancestral path focuses on Northern European and Irish soul tending. My work is nature-based and centers soul tending through the elder Futhark rooms, animism, ancestral tending, and death work. Okay, so welcome Kelly. It's wonderful to have you here tonight. So thank you for, for finding the time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, shall we jump straight in? I have so many things I would love to talk to you about. And um, we had a conversation a few weeks ago where the concept of a t-shirt came up. I hope you can remember <laughs> what I mean, but I thought it was so fantastic. Do you mind if we return to that? Like you said something about if I have a t-shirt printed now, I and my audience would like to hear what is going to be on that t-shirt. Because, you know, I'm the first one to order it. I, I, I have remembered that when you said that the other day, I laughed out loud. I really did. Um, yes, if if I had a T-shirt that I printed, it would say Elder Well, Die Well, Ancestor Well. That's that's my motto. That's my plan. That's what I'm sticking to. Yeah, and I can only agree because I feel that all of these areas for me rank at the most important work of our time. And I think along with shadow work uh, as well. So I hope to get onto that as well. Like uh, I'm always a bit ambitious in what I want to cover in any dialogue, but let's go for it. So um, could you, I think mean, not everyone who's listening will be familiar with the concept dying well. Would you explain to me as like a soul tender and a death walker, what you mean by that? Dying well means, I think it can mean different things. Um, and, and we're talking about an individual level and also maybe a collective level of dying well. At an individual level, dying well means reconciling trauma of your life and potentially trauma in your death itself so that you can move on to what comes next in a way that you can choose freely. That is also complicated by, of course, we're not just an individual moving through by ourselves. We're, we're enmeshed in all these systems. Some of these systems are community, immediate family dynamics that we're enmeshed in or, or bigger you know, political, social structures, but there are also our ancestral dynamics that, that we're born into. And so dying well in that sense also means reconciling those things. And so, you know, we, we kind of have like, I don't know if you would say like a step one, step two, or sort of just different layers that, that we have to work on, but I do feel like that is the work of our time. We have not died well for a long time in, 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 you and I had this conversation also, I want to say Western world because it's my habit, but I feel like I have to dial it in and be really specific to, to what my lane is. And that has been settler culture in the United States. We, we haven't died here well in a long time. And there are a lot of reasons for why that is. I key among them is not being animistic, I think. Um, but absolutely the work of our time is is dealing with thousands of years of dead that have not died well they have not gotten to reconcile their personal lifetime stuff their ancestral stuff and when it doesn't get reconciled it has to go somewhere somebody mm -hmm. bears that and so the living carry that it complicates our personal lives and the systems that we move among so we're not just talking about it's imperative that we die well 
the, you know, people who can speak this and hear this now, but that we make sure all of those before us have died well, that people in our communities are dying well. Yeah, and often that means reaching out outside time, and that's where the deaf walking comes in. When it comes to, you know, I often speak in my classes of ancestral pain or pain and trauma that pools in the ancestral field. And though the souls of people who are dying, you know, will often move on and transition uh, in the other world, and sometimes they don't, and that causes a problem. But, it, you know, and I think... I personally had a Christian, a Roman Catholic upbringing, and there was this very simplistic idea that once people die, everything is well because, you know, they are miraculously lifted up to heaven. Yeah. Now, I think that that is such a dangerous idea because even as a child, I did psychic work and I observed it wasn't like that. So I've always known that from a very, very young age. So the way I explain it to my own students is that Whatever we do not resolve in this lifetime, you talked about resolving our issues and actively working on things. So whatever we do not resolve, balance, make our peace with, even if we manage to move on in the moment of death, it pulls in that ancestral field. So there's someone who's going to come along, it may even skip a generation, but it's kind of like a backpack, backpack left on the mountain that someone will have to strap on their shoulders again and then carry. And then, you know, what that means is that people are not only working their own issues that they came into work on, call that soul agreements or call that karma, or, you know, you can use words from different traditions. And in the Northern tradition, you would say Orlok. But the point being, um, it doesn't go away. Someone needs to deal with it. So from that point of view, would you say, say Kelly, that we're obviously in a pandemic and, you know, we're all witnessing both, you know, on TV and on our screens, but also I think most of us by now have been touched by the deaths of at least some people in our more personal circle and lives. Would you say that that holds up even more sort of mirrors and invitations for us? I mean, how do you view that? I think it does. And, and I'm glad you bring that up. Um, we, we've talked about this over the weekend in the, the community of the two-year program that I mentor about the, the absolute fatigue and exhaustion and at the same time witnessing that it, it's dire. I mean, the screw has turned even more with this need to, to walk our dead, literally, as we have been talking about, but also the dynamics the, the, the revelation of relationships uh, with poor systems, with harmful systems that have emerged over the last year in pandemic time, to, to be able to death walk those, like all these personal, um, personal habits, personal biases, personal projections. So, you know, even when we talk about death walking, it isn't necessarily just human souls, but other than human souls that in the last year we we can't ignore it and yet we're living it at the at the time you know we're living it simultaneously with this revelation and how to manage the fatigue of what that means on a day-to-day -day basis and how we hold ourselves as soul tenders to be able to make a difference in that it's it's really challenging it's very challenging. And again, I'm aware that, you know, my audience draws from people who have done training with me for years to people who are like on a newsletter and check the links I sent out. So may I ask you to just define for our audience what death walking actually is and why we need it, please. I feel like in the most simplistic terms, death walking is facilitating what is no longer functional in the human layer of um, of being so that it has the opportunity to move on to make choices for what comes next. And I know there are a lot of different schools of thought about what is included in that. I feel like death walking is a large category that can include ancestor tending. And I've, I've talked with other practitioners who parse it out a bit more. They're like, no, death walking is purely doing the human, you know, closing, ushering out part. And once they're out, that's a separate thing. And like, I'm, I'm all fine with however it needs to happen. We just need it to happen. 
Yeah. But, but yeah. to me, the, it is a very broad um, helping what no longer is functional where it is be reconciled in the human realm of being so that it has free options for what comes next. And so do we. So do we who are still here. Yeah, because it frees up space for those of us still here. And I would just like to inject here that in the Northern tradition, when we do sight upon or you know, deaf walking, soul conductor work, um, you know, in my own work and with my students, I do that by means of the wild hunt. And the whole issue about the wild hunt, it isn't only about these, there's like a, it's visualized, conceptualized as a hunting party with a like supernatural leader, such as the deity or like one of the, you know, say Odin or Freya, or, you know, could be other beings who kind of like sweep over the land. They're coming through the air, very close to the land. And the whole idea is not only do they sweep up those souls who are not at peace, who may be like floating between the worlds and need to let go of attachments that tether them to the earth. But what the wild hunt also does, it sweeps out the ether. So any kind of, you know, old paradigms, uh, things that didn't go to fruition or, you know, things that have been manifested but you know serve no purpose anymore like think of really dodgy political systems or well you name it it's absolutely endless but the beauty of the wild hunt is it does both things at the same time because as that party is accumulating more souls and then you have to get you know psychopons uh even hum human psychopons if they have the skill can sort of join and help the effort but also the, the great movement of that party over the land sweeps with it like a huge room. It sweeps out the ether and space between the worlds. I like and, that. Yeah. I like that. And I, I, as I get older, I appreciate more and more knowing approaches and allies who are there to help. Like you don't have to do it all yourself. You don't have to hold the space all yourself. And there are allies and elements that are waiting to help us do that kind of work. Yeah, and that's absolutely true. And you know, a lot of the time it's almost a case of observing it because through the act of sacred witnessing, space is held for something can occur. So, so to speak, a lot of the time we don't need to get our hands dirty. A lot of the time being willing to observe and sit in that space, bear witness to what is going on, witness on the level of soul, that in itself holds huge healing power. It's my observation. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, um, I know another subject close to your heart and also to my heart, because, you know, we have talked from time to time, is eldering, uh, being an elder in our communities. And I believe that you're even writing on that topic at the moment. Am I correct about that? I absolutely am. That so tell us, what, what is your take? I know you can't tell us everything that's going to be in a book, but could we have the... Um, um, the summarized version, the most important pieces. I feel like what it what it really needs to encompass is validating people's inner yearning of feeling like some kind of leadership is missing and also some sort of inner yearning that I have a role. I have a job to fulfill in that. Part of that yearning is for me to fulfill. And, you know, I'm Gen X you know, culture and by and large, that's the generation it was the latchkey kid generation. It was the generation that kind of was catapulted into a lot of adult arenas without, um, without elders, <laughs> without well elders to necessarily prepare them to actually be ready to do those things. I think that's just the canary though, that, that, that generation may have been the canary in the coal mine. And what's real is that we haven't had elders for a long time. We haven't had them probably as long as we haven't been animistic, I would say. But realizing that not only is that real, that, that dynamic that we have sensed of somebody supposed to be in, in charge of this and, and compassionately so, but I have a role to play in what that role is. Part of it is mine. And part of being able to step into the role of elder is, you know, things like understanding your own needs, understanding your boundaries, uh, and, and death walking. I, I feel strongly 
that death walking at a base level is an animistic thing that we are all supposed to be doing as opposed to this very special elite shamanic thing that only some people are supposed to be doing. There are deeper skills to all of it, absolutely. But the ability to understand our needs and, and know how to fill them, the ability to set boundaries and know when boundaries need to be flexible and to honor other people's boundaries and the ability to let go, to let go of what we don't need in our lives, to death walk. I feel like those are like the three key things that I need to do a really good job with <laughs> yeah. in this book. Mm -hmm. and, and the runes are a huge part of that. You and I have kind of talked around that subject as well, but I really feel like the Elder Futhark in particular is excellent at helping people understand needs, boundaries, and... Oh, absolutely. And we'll get to that. It's actually on my list here. You know, it says runes, Elder Futhark. So believe me, we'll get to that. I'm just going to be a bit sort of Dutch and pedantic. Would you mind telling us how, why you use the word animism and how, what you mean by that? What is your definition of that word? Because again, for the general audience listening, that may not immediately make sense. I feel like there are tons of approaches to what animism is. Very scholarly, very academic, and very out in the woods, just kind of being in the woods. For me, it is the experience that we are already in relationship with everything around us. It, and not just relationship, but it's family. And in that awareness, we can communicate, we have reciprocity, um, we have the ability to be supported and support in a way that the perspective that we're separate from nature and we just live on nature to get what we need out of it, that perspective doesn't in any way facilitate the wholeness and relationships that are available, sort of like we talked about earlier, to, to just help us not have to hold all the space by ourselves. So it, it isn't a belief that, that we are in relationship, but the experience that we are. And in that experience, we can gain the skill set that is shamanic to enable us to be very effective caregivers. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, it's not only about perceiving ourselves to be in relationship. I would go one step further even and say we are in relationship with all that is, all that surrounds us, even the so-called non-sentient beings, like think of mountains uh, or, you know, features in the landscape, which we don't commonly perceive as having an, an inanimate you know, spirit. But the point is, by opting out and no longer perceiving ourselves to be in relationship with all that, it doesn't mean that we are not. It just means you just talk about the importance of boundaries in eldering. It just means that in terms of our relationship with all of these other beings from the animal world to the mineral world to the seas, the forests, I mean, et cetera, et cetera, you name it, that we are going to be overstepping boundaries if we come at that from the wrong point of view. And then what we're doing, we're just uh, adding to that huge ancestral debt, if you call it, or that ancestral burden that we started talking about. Because, you know, it's the same with um, groups as it is with individuals. But whatever a group of people does not dissolve it, um, or resolve, sorry, it will also pull in the collective ancestral field, meaning another group needs to come along and essentially do the cleaning up work. And they may not even know they're doing it. They will just ask why life has to be so tough. Absolutely. So the other thing I just wanted to mention here as well, you've talked about the importance of eldering. And I think essentially what you're describing is a really good self-care and boundaries. But through that, I think we become role models for others. Because she started by saying we've, we've lost our elders and where are we? I mean, if, if we have no generation of people left who can model for us, like how things are done properly, like how do we expect young people to get it? So I just wanted to ask if you, like me, see that the flip side of that coin is that in tribal societies it's often the elders do the rites of passage work and hold the space of initiation for young people 
And, you know, having lost the elders, we've also lost the people who performed that crucial rite of passage, meaning we have a lot of young people who are at a, you know, a loss as well. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Because the whole, the whole reason that, that we want to learn to set boundaries and know what our needs are and recognize what needs to be death locked in our lives is because we step into a communal version of ourselves. I, I think there could be a lot of phrases for what that version of self is called, but, but this community self that is transpersonal, we begin to live that through everything we do. It's not just this amorphous extra chakra that's, you know, somewhere <laughs> out there. We live it, we become it. And that, I, I, one of the key points in the book, I feel like is, really stepping away from this idea that we're supposed to get everything from our earth parents and and especially when our earth parents couldn't they they couldn't for whatever reason and dealing with with everything that comes out of that kind of relationship and lack and yet realizing we have earth and sky parents we have celestial elemental parents who are in this animistic you know experience there they're they're there to to help us know how to elder and to help us hold the space to be that communal self yeah i think that's a really important point like even thinking of the big rocks in the landscape as like you know elders who watch over us i mean i absolutely feel it that way like you're know, sitting by these big rocks or sitting in a stone circle is like sitting with my ancestors so yeah i really feel that um, also then on the subject of, you know, rites of passage and initiation, and we've already touched upon the level of suffering that we observe in our world right now, because we're in pandemic times. Um, you had a post up on Facebook a few days ago. It was in the public domain. You said something really amazing I want to throw in here to lead into the whole subject of like, you know, pain and suffering. You said that people who don't take responsibility for themselves are 95% of my life stress. I thought it was totally quotable. It's fantastic. You think written down on a piece of paper. So, uh, you know, because that is like the opposite of what we're talking about, taking responsibility and like, you know, being aware. So I would like to talk for a moment about people often can be, what's the word? When people do not really understand what we do, they can be very kind of flippant or dismissive. It will go like, like say, I had this knee injury for the last two and a half months and became really immobilized. I was on crutches, I could barely go upstairs and so forth. And then people say, but hey, you do healing work. Aren't you a teacher of this supposedly powerful material? Why don't you just go heal yourself? Now, of course, that's exactly what I was doing. And an awful lot of insights have come from that period of being sure. wrong. But like, what would you say about that? The kind of relationship between, between being called to do this kind of work and like say serious life challenges or even chronic health issues? I think there's a lot to be said. I got to dial it in. I think that we, I'm going to say settler culture just to stay in my lane, but, you know, apply it where it goes. We don't have an awareness of long-term suffering. And that is something else that's emerged over the last year. Mm -hmm. that we, we have the, this is an unwritten book. Maybe it will get published, but you know, our, I think the first line of that book is our cultural bandwidth for chronic illness is get better or die. Wow. Mm. It really is. And I, I, maybe I'll get to finish that one too, but, um, we really don't have an awareness of, of long-term discomfort. And the truth is everything isn't healable in the context that we want to think healing is. Like we want to have this, this box and this is the healing box and I'm just going to give you the healing box and everything will be fine. And, and that it'll, it works sometimes, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work or it doesn't, um, it doesn't meet your definition of, of what you expect to come out of it. And we have to work to really have sort of cultivation of holding difficult space and still answering our calling. Like, I mean, that is the ultimate challenge to me is, is being able to, 
sit with what needs to be dealt with, however it needs to be addressed, and still in your spiritual path be able to say, what can I do? It, it's, it may not look the way I thought it was going to look five years ago. This isn't my dream. This isn't you know, the creative project I thought I was going to do. This isn't the mobility I thought I was going to have. Mm. And yet, so what, what can I do? You know, we, we don't have the ability to hold those things beside each other. And I feel like that is where a lot of the misunderstanding of why don't you just go heal yourself comes from we we don't don't know what healing means in these situations where it doesn't match the definition we've carried all along but also there i think we really need to make a distinction between a cure and a healing because a healing can take many forms and healing sometimes can take the form of making our peace with something that is not ideal and will never be but by making our peace with it we can still unhook ourselves from it but it's not a cure of the total situation and because of the pandemic, I just wanted to throw in there how, you know, even more so, I think a year ago in the earlier days of the pandemic, that at least here in the UK, I know you're in the US, you know, we'd have these horrendous uh, death figures running on our screens. But then the TV presenters would say, oh, but a large percentage of them had underlying health conditions anyway. And people, ah, okay. And I think that's maybe, or at least it illustrates what you mean by get well or die. But, you know, now I think we have so many people with what we call long COVID that it's just not tenable anymore to say that people will choose now, like, you know, get well, or if you have an underlying health condition and like maybe you're not long for this world. And, you know, a lot of people who have underlying health conditions have said to me, I feel extremely uh, uncomfortable and deprioritized by the way that that's just thrown around. Oh, underlying health condition. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's fine then. Of course, that's not yeah. fine. Oh, yeah. It's very dismissive and it's very rude and it's very painful to hear. You know? It is painful. You're right. I, I turned 50 last week and I've noticed in the last few months when I go to the doctor now, they say, well, you know, this is age appropriate. And, I'm, and I say, well, this has been going on for 20 years and you told me I was too young to uh. be, you're yeah. too young to be dealing with this. And I'm like, where's the sweet spot? <laughs> where's the part where you just see me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, because all of that kind of phrasing, I think for me it's ultimately an opt-out. It allows people to disengage or to dissociate and say, oh, yeah, your problem has nothing to do with me. And that's a very human instinct. And that's also at the heart of a lot of, you know, lack of shadow work. We just project out so the other person ends up carrying the burden and we can at least temporarily walk away scot free. I think that is well said. Well and I mean, that's another job of the true uh, ferocious, fierce elder is to call people on their shadow work and also to give it back to them to say, I'm sorry, this is your stuff. This is not my energy flow to give. You know? So, yeah, I think that that, that that makes a lot of sense. So, um, well, you already mentioned the runes. I know, you know, I work with the runes and, you know, I teach rune magicians and you work with the runes. My understanding of it is that you work with the runes in a different way from the way I do. So that's why this conversation is interesting. So, um, just I know I read out in your bio that, you know, you always do like a rune forecast, which I think is twice a month because it's fortnightly. So would you explain to us weekly? It's weekly. Oh, it's weekly (laughs) even. That's even more impressive. I was under the impression because I know that, you know, you use a system where every period of two weeks, a fortnight in the year, has been allocated to rooms. So the the wheel of the year has been teamed up with the wheel of the rooms. And that's how you arrive at a constant, like a half monthly room, which is used like in your, in your, um, what do you call it, broadcast or podcast. So I was just going to, you know, you know more about it than me. So I was just going to invite you to talk about that a bit and also how you use those rooms in all of these topics we've just covered, because she said they're great allies. That's, that's, that's a big conversation. Big topic, but hey, it's let's go so, for it. Put you on. <laughs> so there are many runic calendars for starters that there, there isn't one runic calendar. Mm. However, <laughs> In order, I think, really to 
get a sense of how the runes might move in a progression for you individually, you really have to be animistically in touch with where you live. I, I call it where you stand. You know, where you stand, you would have to be very aware of, of how the runes are situating for you in your space and, and how your season progresses. And the truth is most of us are, are not going to do that. We're, you know, we can, we can make our relationships, you know, the invitations for that to happen, but most of us aren't going to do that. And so I fell back on the work that Nigel Pennick did in his book, Runic Astrology, which I have on really good authority, might get re-released. Um, and he, he I, I adore his work, but he has done a tremendous amount of calculation and, and culling academically, but also spiritually. He is not spiritually detached from this. This is, this is the way he approaches it as well. To, to come up with the calendar that works at like a planetary universal wheel, so to speak. So, you know, I've had a lot of people say, oh, that's crap. You can't, you can't just wedge it in. And I'm like, well, we have been wedged in for a long time with the Gregorian calendar. And so it's really <laughs> difficult to try to come back to this very loose, you know, different perceptions of time and space and, and say that we're just going to, you know, set our modern lives to that and everything adds up perfectly. It's not going to happen. So, you know, you do you, I'm going to work with what he did. <laughs> and I admired that book, Runic Astrology, for a long time, but grieved that there wasn't sort of, uh, and here's how you do it. Here's, you know, he, he, the book is like, here's how I arrived at all of this, these calculations and so forth, but not a sort of devotional, here's what you do with it. And that's what I wrote in Runic Book of Days. And, and, and run free. And so that that's what I encourage people to do in the book. Like here are some brass tacks of the Elder Futhark, how they might move seasonally progressively through the year and give you these little half month, which are like two weeks and some change pockets to sit with each rune and, and call it into your life and, and you know see what, what relationship builds from that. Because I know a lot of times when people study the runes like a primer, they get really bogged down. They're like, well, I don't feel like I mastered this one, and and but there's you know 23 others, or, or and and so kind of that that seasonal right. approach, it it gives you a saturation, but also a boundary to say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna sit with this for two weeks. It's gonna be part of my spirits of place, and I'm gonna bless it. And next year, I'll see it again. You know, we're, we're, we're going to keep yeah. going with this. So that that's kind of the basis of the book. The weekly rune that I write is a rune cast that is based on the half month, whatever the current rune would be in his seasonal runic calendar. And then sort of some intuitive runes drawn around it to help you best work with that half month rune. Yeah, so at the moment that rune would be Fihu, or I would say Fei in the Northern tradition, right? Because, you know, I did my research, I had a look, and that would make sense because we've just had the summer solstice, so from my point of view, just more through Dagas. So kind of like, we're going to be starting the rune wheel all over again. Yeah, I think tomorrow, according to his calendar, we would move into Urus. Okay, nice. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a, those runes, I just sizzle every time we move through those runes. They're they're tremendous about being a soul in form. Yeah. Yeah, and I believe he even says that you can, you know, just like it's done in astrology, that we kind of like we move through a year and, you know, the planets sort of move around. But there's also such a thing as planetary hours. So you can also move through a day as in a 24-hour period and kind of feel these subtle shifts as we move from one constellation to another. And I believe that you can do that with the maybe more advanced work, but you can do that with the rooms as well, that, you know, you make an agreement with yourself because you say there is not just one system and I can certainly sort of see there would be different arguments to be made for how it could be done differently. I mean, I've had to look at this myself, I've fiddled around with it. But I like you could... those arguments. You know, a lot of people think I'm gonna go, no, but no, 
you have to come into relationship the way that it mm. works for you. Exactly. And even if that means, you know, with my own uh, room magician students, I sometimes talk about the dial on the washing machine, say if something really doesn't fit for you, like be like turn the dial and sort of see if, if you know, the clockwork lines up or not. And don't get too hung up on this is absolutely right or it's absolutely wrong. It's about being in relationship. And if this brings you insights and it's helpful for you, then the dial is on the right, the right setting for you. That's how I explain it to my own students. So, um, yeah, anything else about the runes or have you said enough about the runes? I don't know. Can we ever say enough about the runes? I don't think so. People go for like books can. about runes. <laughs> I, they are, if, if there are keys that can help us elder well, to the whole deal, elder, die, ancestor well, I really feel like they're in the runes. And could you actually, you said that before, so it's a key point, but again, uh, you know, quite, I have a whole group of rune magician students and I will, I have like a closed Facebook group for them, so I'll put the link to this video there, so I know that some of them at least are going to be listening. So I think I would really love to hear from you, it's a great statement, but like, you know, like how do you practically do it? How do you use the rooms to elder well, for instance? I honor, uh, th this is all other conversation, Imelda. I know the Utharchist, Futharchist thing. I, I think yeah. I, I call myself by Futharchist because I, <laughs> I can see it both ways. <laughs> but if we're going with that, that traditional ordering that we've been given, and I don't think we have to, but that's what I'm going to roll with for now. They, they give a beautiful progression of in in the first et to to say here's what we need to have in place to be a soul in form and there's there's intense challenge in that there's embarrassment and and um bias and and understanding how we do this in a way that helps us move through the world safely and we end on this super beautiful joy note and then we progress into the second et which is all these other beings are doing that too. And we have to deal with bumping into them. And maybe the way they're doing, maybe they're weird is not going to jive with ours and, and dealing with the challenges of the second et and still ending on a relatively high note where we have allies. We have this, this nature um, elemental force that has our backs. And then we kind of progress into the third et where we know the deal and we're sore. <laughs> we, we arrive a little bit sore and raw and we have a lot of choices to make about how we're going to let the wisdom of that experience of the first two ets filter into how we move through form and, and ultimately kind of come to this place where that's it. There, there aren't cookies at the end of the rune show. There aren't balloons and confetti. There's the realization that this is it and we're going to do it. We're just, we're going to cycle through that. We're going to do it all over again. Yeah. And, and <laughs> yeah. learning to find the beauty in that. Like, as you were saying before, learning to find the peace in that. Yeah. I yeah. value that. I, I, I just value it immensely. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, like for me, the rooms are tremendous allies and I wouldn't swap them for anything. I think it also depends on like what you learn. Absolutely. A lot of people talk to me about tarot cards and for me, you know, it just studied it a little bit but never got very far with it. And I've just accepted that for me, it's not tarot cards. Like I clearly am meant to be working with the rooms. And also in that third act you just talk about, for me, there are a lot of astronomical rooms there. there you know, I feel you get insights that aren't even just personal anymore, but you get to the transpersonal and the cosmic and the larger sort of cycles of time that play out. You see, that's very philosophical. So, yeah, I'm completely with you there. Yeah, great. Um, <laughs> then I would also like to talk a bit about... Um, you know, I know you have two children, twins, um, I think they're younger than our lot. I have three young men, they're not really children anymore, like, they all like tower over me and they have hairy legs and stuff. So I think <laughs> I have to learn to not call them children anymore, they're like young men. But um, how 
Does that work for you? Are your children interested in what you do? How do you bring your, you know, your runes and your spiritual practices into your parenting? I think that's a huge question for many people. When they were probably four or five, we started working on the runes. And I, I think maybe they knew them before they knew the English alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> and they made them, you know, like they made their own set of runes. And, and so, you know, they they find the runes in a lot of aspects of life. The challenge of holding the space to let them see what my worldview and experience is and, and hold it openly for them to form their own is mm -hmm. challenging because, you know, as the parent, you can't prescribe that. You, you just kind of have to open the space and and let them move in it as they will one of them is incredibly intuitive and articulate about it and the other one doesn't think they're intuitive but is and isn't articulate about it at all so it's interesting to watch that dynamic play out parenting them has probably been one of the two most profound steps in eldering that I've experienced. You learn to say no, just in life, not necessarily to them, but to them too. You learn to say no effectively in parenting. And, and I needed that. I don't know that I was gonna get that another way. Yeah. So, you know, I often say like my children are my greatest teachers, but it sounds like it's you would agree with that because they are tremendous teachers. Aren't it's they? true. And, and it's, it's hard sometimes because they, I don't, I don't know what vocabulary they would use to describe themselves, but they're very concerned about nature. They're mm -hmm. very um, willing to listen to nature and, and be compassionate in nature. And they're also pissed off. They're they're like, why aren't we doing more? Like, how yeah. do you know we're mm -hmm. about five? And they were understanding recycling. And we were like, well, this is what we do. And and then they would say, Mom, is this recyclable? And I'm like, it is, but not here. Yeah. And like, yeah. Why? And, yeah. and and they would be like, why aren't we doing more? And and I'm like, well, we'll ha we'll have that conversation also. <laughs> I think that's really great. <laughs> but, you know, even the word recycling, it reminds me of a boy who was in, I, I ran a shamanic program for children and young people for five years. And there was a boy in that group who at some point then started asking questions. I think he maybe was, I don't know, 10 at that point, nine or 10. So he started asking his mother, like, where do I go when I die, etc., etc. And his mother, very shamanic, you know, this is an important conversation. I'm going to sit down and really explain, you know, explain this property. And I'm not going to shy away from it. So she tried to give him the whole lowdown and she understood it. And he just said, oh, okay, so we all get recycled. And then he ran off to play. Like for him, like, it was very straightforward. There you go. Well, yeah, we all get recycled. <laughs> there you go. I mean, is there a quicker way of saying it? That is a great way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, well... I mean, I could think of many more topics, but I actually have managed to get through the ones on my list. So I was going to ask, do you have any questions for me or so? Or is there a topic that you would like to talk about that I haven't raised? You know, I do have a question for you. Um, I know that one of the things you did through the pandemic was bring your practice and teaching more virtual. Mm. And that I, that's something that I did a few years ago when I got really, really sick and I, I, I didn't want to do that, but I kind of did it out of necessity. And I've had a lot of people say it can't be nearly as effective. That's, that's right up there with the, the, the chronic illness, heal yourself thing. How has it been for you? Um, I think very, very interesting. Um, like you, I didn't want to do it. I mean, like even a year ago, I had two sort of, you know, long-term students and associates who've been with me for years, who pretty much, um, you know, dragged me to it and said, Imelda, this is what you're going to do next. So there's going to be a long pause here and you don't want that. It's not fair on your students. So kind of like, I mean, the horse was not only let the water, the horse, you know, the face was stuffed in the water bucket. And I'm very glad they did. I'm extremely grateful to these two people that they put me teaching online. And I think the whole process has been 
it's very, very different. I mean, there is a stress to it that we don't experience in real teaching. I mean, real teaching can be extremely stressful in a different way. Like, don't misunderstand me. But for me, the kind of dealing with the tech and the mishaps, and, you know, I'm not yeah. a natural born tech person, adds a layer of stress I don't feel at all in a regular classroom. And also there's just something to the, you know, when people are in a room together and you do ceremony and, you know, you can have that pot of tea afterwards and sit on the floor and talk. Right. Um, so that was quite difficult, but I've also found that it is amazing how far you can actually go on Zoom and how you can do substitutes. Like for instance, um, again, this is not very kosher <laughs> after the pandemic, but I used to sort of say at the beginning on the end, like when we form a circle, let's all hold hands and physically form that circle. And then, you know, when a workshop closed five days later, I'd say let's all hold hands again. And now we sort of release the circle with love and gratitude. And with that whole hand holding business was disinfecting and stuff. <laughs> well, you know, that took a different swing. <laughs> but then I discovered that even on Zoom, you can do that. You can say to people that, you know, because people see, you know, like we see each other now. And to sort of say, well, you know, you're holding the hand of the person on your left and on your right. And I give them certain instructions and, you know, perform certain actions. And actually, when you do, you feel their hands in your hands, even on Zoom. Not just that, you know, whose hands you're holding. So it's almost like uncanny how... You know, I think Zoom also has certain, we'll call it shamanic or endless, if you like, properties that in a very real way, it can dissolve time and space. And the other thing is because for years I was teaching in both like Europe and in the US primarily. And for years I was saying to my art students or even my room students, but especially the art students, oh, you should see what my art students in the US are doing. Yeah, yeah, sounds interesting, nothing. And then I would talk to my students in the US and say, what are the people in Europe doing? Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he said, you know, I can like give you their name so you can look for their work on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mel, and nothing happened. But now, because of Zoom, they're all in the same classes. So all my teaching is late afternoon, evening, yeah. so people in the US can come in. I even have one room magician student in Antarctica. So when I sent out time zones, the conversion for Antarctica is in that whole list of different locations, which I think is hilarious. A room yeah, magician awesome. at a research station in Antarctica. I think that's fantastic. Awesome. Um, but now, actually, and that's even without me putting in the effort that my students are telling me that from the people I've met in these classes, they form little subgroups and they Zoom each other and they still work the material when I'm not there as a teacher anymore. And then, you know, I closed Facebook groups where they share their artworks. So I see what they are doing and they take me so I can have a look at it. But it's actually really amazing to see how there is that cooperation across the Atlantic going on. And I don't even need to suggest it or drive it. It was my vision kind of 10 years ago. I couldn't make it happen. And I'm not trying to make it happen. And it's exploded around me like a wildflower garden. That's wonderful. And I think another thing, because you can record things, that's very revolutionary. So you're reaching that point that certain basics, say whatever, a basic room class or a what is sacred class or what is sacred art. You can actually record that and still make that available so people can go and do that in their own time. So I often feel that I'm still teaching while I sleep because people are attending my classes while I sleep. And what that has done is that, you know, once you have done that and you can present that again, it actually frees up time and space to go in new creative directions. Yes, and so a thing that I've gotten into is that some of the courses I teach were requested by students who made really good suggestions and the whole group said, yes, we want that. And normally I would say my whole schedule is full. I can't cram more in, but I've now had the opportunity to say, okay, if you all want that, like for instance, there's a series of healing the witch wound classes that was suggested by um, a student of mine called Catherine Howard. And, uh, you know, we had a fantastic time in the first class. After the first class, and, and Catherine is in the UK, after the first class, a student in the US, Sandra Price, had a very interesting dream where the witch became a private eye or a private investigator. So she shared that dream and it has sort of said jokingly, there is a class in that. And she said, well, I hope you write that class because I want to attend it. So, you know, so I've been writing classes based on my own dreams and on my students' dreams. And then the whole group comes together again and people bring more dreams into the pot. So there is far more of a kind of co-dreaming quality to it and also that things aren't so set like 
in the past of pre-pandemic, I knew what my teaching schedule looked like four years ahead. I knew exactly in what location in the world I was going to be doing what. And then if people asked for something outside that, I'd be very busy saying, no, I can't fit that in this year. And so this is like, it's a completely different way of working. And uh, as I said, that's still, I said, I'm not a tech goddess. So, I mean, the tech struggles are real. They do get better when you do a lot of it, I have to say. And But also there's still things you can't do on Zoom. I mean, you know, like high seat ceremonies or the whole of the room magicians. I mean, you know, there is a limit. And I really yearn for those things to come back up. But I think in reality, going forward, I can't see that I would drop the teaching online altogether. So I hope the pandemic will lift or ideally disappear altogether to a point where, you know, there can be a kind of sacred balance where there can be like, you know, a certain amount of online work and then also that in-person work I love so much. But what about you? That was a long answer, sorry. Um, almost everything you said. I mean, it, it is very effective. I mean, there, there are absolutely places where you feel held in the space that you've created. And, and there are ways to create space over a vast distance and feel every person in that space. It, I love that. I, I really appreciate the ability to do that. Where I live, there are not a lot of people having this conversation. And it's been really valuable to me um, from, the, from the standpoint of a teacher, but also a, a person in community to be able to make those connections in a deep spiritual way, not just, you know, in a mental, you know, communication sort of way. I, I really value that. Um, like you said, being able to have coursework available, you know, any time of day that a person wants to start it anywhere in the world, mm. that's super valuable. And I feel like you know, we have to acclimate to that, whether we want to be fully in person or, or you know, we don't think that that the online stuff is as valid. We have to make it valid. We have to figure that out. And, and you know, the last year has been deep lessons in in breaking some biases around that approach to soul not being enough you know, no, we're not able to hug and we're not able to do a tea ceremony right now. And maybe we will be at some point. And those are precious in their own place, but we don't have to throw out what we do have available right now. It is, it's been wonderful. I have a, I have a two year training, soul tending training that I lead and the community around that has been wonderful. It had to change a lot. It, I mean, people got sick. You know, like people got sick last year, mm -hmm. they had family members that died, they, they lost jobs. And, you know, so mm -hmm. those things took a much greater toll on people's ability to hold their spiritual space than having to claim online space as spiritual. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, these are all, you know, like huge issues on that also. That's one of the lessons on the pandemic times that we have to then roll with whatever the pandemic throws up. So that also means that, you know, unless you're a kind of dinosaur, which I try not to be, it means that everything <laughs> has to change. Now, I, I do something, accuse myself of being a dinosaur. I say it about myself, but for me, the pandemic has been very powerful anti-dinosaur uh, medicine. Um, but yeah, I think my final question for today is then going to be, you mentioned the word community. And I think that's such a huge thing. It's such a key word because also, you know, we've all been locked up in our houses here in the UK. I don't know about the US. I haven't been there for 18 months, but in the US when the pandemic started, got home the last flight out of Philadelphia. You know, I nearly I got stuck that. there for quite a <laughs> I while. I remember you saying that and I thought. <laughs> yes. So I'd be at Philadelphia airport, all the flights canceled, praying the flight to London would go. Got three kids over here. Can you and imagine. Scary. <laughs> Anyway, I haven't been there since, but I know that here in the UK, like notoriously, the government was making announcements such as after May 17th, you're allowed to you're allowed to hug family members again. And you think, what has the world come to that the government yes. tells us if we can like hug family members and all, you know, it's like that's like really, really crazy. But then back to the subject of um community for a moment. Has and you've already talked about it in a teaching sense, but also, I mean, 
I agree, teachers also need to be in community. And we sometimes need to talk to colleagues because it gets very lonely holding it all down by yourself. Has the pandemic for you changed the way you view and access your community? It has. It absolutely, I mean, I, so many ways. I realize places where I can do more. I mean, truly, like with, with all the limitations that I'm handling, I, I realize places where I can do more and, and am doing more. And that was so necessary. Um, also, just understanding what community serves for me personally. Like, we need to know that. We, we just kind of have this assumption you're, you're going to be part of a family. You're, you're going mm -hmm. to be part of a community. But we really... We really do need to know what our role in that is and do it. And, and you know, because we're not there for no reason. We have some, you know, lower sea calling maybe in our communities to be able to do what that community needs. That's how it stays alive. That's how yeah. it, you know, gains its life force and its agency. And and being able to realize what community ne means for me, what I need from it. And inversely, what I give back to it has been everything. And it has, it's generated changes in my two year program as a result. And, and this is something that we've, you know, very democratically talked about and said, okay, you know, we all have full lives. We, we all have families. We all have very <laughs> full lives. What are we doing as, as this community? And this community has become its own life force. You know, there's a point when you when you foster a group along the way, it begins to have its own cosmology. It begins to have its own agency, and the conversation of the people in it needs to change to respect and and hold that. And so, you know, there there are growing pains and really, really growth, a lot of growth. Period about mm -hmm. what that community means and and where we want it to go together. Yeah, so you get both the growing pains and the really big gains. And then what of that at the moment there is a trend for people to be in what I think of as bubble communities, you know, like social media facilitates this whole thing. Oh, we'll just snooze this person, unfollow that person, unfriend that person. And personally speaking, I'm really weary of that. I know people have said to me, well, my Facebook homepage is like my uh, living room. So kind of I set a boundary of what happens there. And I can completely understand that because, you know, of course, you want to feel welcome and safe on your own page. I mean, I get that. But on another level, I feel if I'm going to do all of that sort of tweaking and I don't let the dissenting voices anymore, then who am I in dialogue with? Exactly. I am in, you know, what, exactly. you know, in that sort of, you know, echo chamber or that hall of mirrors or whatever you want to call it. So do you have any wisdom to share on that? that you know, I think for a lot of people now, when, when you know, like when I use the word community, like I'm 54, so for me, community is still like when I was a child, we had a church community, there was a school community. So for community, for me, very community is also the people who are around me that I don't necessarily choose. They're my next door neighbor. They're the people I sit in class with, you know, whatever, whatever. My parents' friends that I wouldn't have for friends, whatever it might be. But there is now, and you know, sort of three young men in the house, this trends away to the sort of, you know, like bubble communities. And like from a point of like, you know, animism and, you know, like if we're going to be closing on the t-shirt concept again, how do you see that? Do you have anything to say about that? I feel like social media is a huge lesson in boundaries and shadow. Over and, mm. over and and when I hear people saying, you know, I, I don't like the echo chamber effect, I'm like, you have the power. And 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 it's it's challenging because so much of our social engagement plays out over social media. It's not just someone we pass in the hallway mm. or you know in the street anymore. And it, it's hard. It, it it's genuinely hard, but we have to we have to learn what our boundaries are with that and they are not that different you know the boundaries you have in the grocery store are not that different from social media well and, they, uh, i think they shouldn't be but one issue is that also social media allows people to be on there but use a fantasy name so a lot of people on various social media platforms 
I mean, you know, I think I called an Instagram follower this week who was good God, I'm like, yeah, right, you know. Or like another time I called on Facebook, a friend's request from Archangel Gabriel. Yeah, right, you know, he's doing Facebook right, now. Right, yeah, I mean, yeah, it makes sense. So I think what you then get, and I don't like that the word troll is used for this. For me, trolls are the beings behind my house um, right. in Sweden, in the forest, and, you know, well, there's a whole sort of, you know, a whole wisdom and a whole tradition to that. I don't just really like that these people are now called trolls as a kind of appropriation of a word that for me means something else yes. in the Northern tradition, but nevertheless. But I think that is also because, you know, in the past, what you said about, you know, your community, your village, people you meet in the grocery store, even if you don't know their names, they're local to you. You know, you'll meet them again and that imposes some boundaries on your behavior. But there are also people out there who hide behind the kind of fantasy name so you've no idea who they are where they are and they're just like out there you know projecting a lot of shadow onto other people so um and for me that's one of the things that makes social media different from what happens you know on my road or in my village i find that i'm over the last year very done with a lot of aspects of social media and and that's saying a lot having come through four years of trump you know that was that was a lot of paring down of, of friends but i find that different different places sort of attract or, or may i don't know you know because all the algorithms decide so many things behind yeah. the scenes but facebook for me is a lot harder to curate i don't know if that's quite the word i want to use but it's it's a lot harder for me to streamline um how i want to be in relationship with people and i find myself not as engaged on facebook i, mm. I do prefer i prefer instagram and tiktok over facebook right now yeah, you put me on to tiktok i checked it out and i caught so dizzy i haven't been there since but it was only because you said that there was a real education going on there yeah. and it's over and had a look <laughs> it's it's interesting because I, I have i've not spent as much time with tiktok but it, i can learn something in about 12 seconds on yeah. tiktok that makes me look at life very differently and that doesn't yeah. happen on facebook too much <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, I mean, I'm on TikTok, I mean, keeping up on that, but like, I even feel like on Twitter, I had some very interesting conversations mm -hmm. on Twitter today that now make me think I have to go back and read up on some things in the Poetic Edda, because there were some statements made by, well, you know, like, hang on, to write about that, there's a connection I haven't spotted yet. That was Twitter today. I, mean, I can't you know. wait to see where you go with that. Yeah, well, you know, maybe in another uh, podcast. I actually hope we will talk again. I think we're coming up to the one hour mark and also to be kind on our listeners, um, you know, who need to find the time to listen to this. Um, I think we should bring it to a close now. Um, do you have any sort of closing words of wisdom or have you said everything you need to say today? I have really enjoyed spending time with you and, and I'm super grateful to have space with you and with your listeners. Well, thank you very much. You know, it's also a donation of your time and I know how busy you are and like how much is going on. Some of it was touched upon. So thank you for taking that time out of your schedule. And thank you so much for being here. And I know that my audience or following will really love hearing from you. So everyone, this was episode number four. Stay tuned. There are more exciting guests coming and I'll see you all soon again. Thank you very much. Kelly Harrell. Thank you.